as we think of sharing the gospel, presenting the gospel, bearing witness to the gospel um, among any people, we need to keep in mind what the worldview is. And so as I converse with Muslims uh, and bear witness to the gospel, I always seek to keep in mind this basic worldview framework, you see. Um, and we've taken that very seriously in East Africa, uh, as I'm sure people throughout this part of Russia have as well. But um, let me just tell you a little bit how we have worked at attempting to address this worldview as we share the gospel as good news. Uh, I was in Somalia when one night, one of these, we call them Nicodemuses, you know, Nicodemus came to Jesus at night to ask for, uh, uh, to, in, to inquire with him about the message and mission of Jesus. And so we call these people the Nicodemuses who would come at night to inquire. One time a Nicodemus came to me at night and said, I would like to have a simple book that describes the Christian faith for me as a Muslim, so that I as a Muslim could understand what you believe. It's a very good question. I did not know what to give him. I had C.S. Lewis and whatnot and whatnot on my shelves, you know, but I didn't have a book written especially for Muslims with their worldview in mind. And so on the spur of the moment, I says, okay, I will write that book. <laughs> There's several times I've written quite a number of books in my lifetime and quite often it comes to me like that. It gets born in my soul. And I'll say to my wife, Grace, another book was born in my soul. She says, uh-oh, another year, David. In fact, she sort of jokes that for David to write a book is like conceiving a child. It takes nine months from conception to birth. <laughs> and during that nine months, it is hard, hard work. Anyway, I said, I will write it. This was in Somalia. I was headmaster of a school. When the school closed for vacation, I met with three Somalis who had come to faith in Jesus. And together, we worked at developing a Bible study for Muslims, which began with Genesis 1 and went to Revelation 22. Just tell the biblical story. Now that is very attractive to Muslims because when you read the Quran, there's little snippets, little bits of the stories come through but the whole narrative is not there. For example, you ask a Muslim, tell me the story of Noah and the flood. It is referred to in the Quran, you see. And he will say, oh, a great warning. If we do not obey God, he will judge us like during the flood. So tell me the story. Great warning. God will judge us like at the time of Noah and the flood. But he doesn't know the story, you see. And so the biblical narrative which tells the story is exceedingly interesting to our Muslim friends. When we lived in Somalia, we had a Bible story book for children that we always kept on the table in our living room. And whenever Muslims would come to our home, almost every time, they would detour around as they're going to their chair to pick up that Bible story book. And while we're having conversations together and drinking tea, they're paging through this book and looking at the pictures and so forth extremely interesting. So that's what we did. Just tell the story. They found it exceedingly attractive. And many, many uh, studied the Bible through that mimeographed beginnings. Well, then when we moved to Nairobi, Kenya, God brought together around us a remarkable team to revise and perfect that initial effort that we did in Somalia. One of the persons on the team had a doctor's degree from Harvard University in Islamics and was in Kenya to help to resource the churches on being faithful to Christ in a context where Muslims are present. Another was an Arab chap from Zanzibar who met Jesus Christ when he was in prison and someone gave him a New Testament, went on to the University of Beirut to get his, his master's degree in Islamic studies at the American University in Beirut. Others were Somalis from Muslim background uh, who believed in Jesus and uh, several uh, pastors. It was a remarkable team. And every week we would meet together and walk through th the writing of this course, keeping in mind this worldview. 
a concept that we lived with was the latter idea. We would say, this is our Muslim's friend's understanding of the gospel. This is, this is his understanding. What we want to do is to introduce him to the New Testament and biblical witness concerning the gospel. The fullness of the revelation in, in the Bible. That's where we want to go. So he has some ideas of the gospel, but not the fullness of the understanding of the gospel because he has not yet read the gospel. He's not read the Injil or the Zabud and so forth, you know. And so we use the idea of a ladder. And, here, and so every lesson in the course becomes a rung in the ladder. And so we would always ask ourselves, um, in every lesson, will our Muslim friend fall off the ladder? <laughs> because the rungs are too far apart. I remember, for example, when we got to the story of Noah and the flood, I thought this will be a very easy one to write because all Muslims are interested in the story. And so rather quickly, we wrote that chapter and then we submitted it to our team. And our Muslim friends said, th those from Muslim background on the team said, when they get to this chapter, they're going to burn the course. I said, why would they burn the course? Because it's so absolutely offensive. It's so absolutely different than the Islamic understanding. I said, what's, what's the problem with Noah and the flood, that story? What do you think the problem was? Two of every animal, including pigs. No, that's a good guess, but you are, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Any other good guesses? <laughs> OK, I'll tell you, because I was totally surprised. This little verse there in that account that says, God was sorry he made humankind. Now, why would that be such a problem? Because in Islam, God is never affected by us. He is sovereign, almighty. You know, he is never affected by us. He never comes down and experiences what we experience, you see. God is sorry. He is affected. <laughs> His emotions are affected by our sin. Oh, they said, that is just such a revolution. We said, but that is the gospel. And so we didn't elaborate. We didn't make any commentary on it. We simply says, the Torah of the prophet Moses reveals God was sorry he made humankind. Put it in a little block, you know, just drop this revolutionary idea in. But we didn't elaborate on it at all. And because uh, we said, this is a sign of the gospel right here. The seed is right here. God is affected by what we do. And that's what the gospel, the heart of the gospel is, that God is profoundly affected by what we do. You see, so that's how we worked at it. And then we took it into Muslim areas and had, our, had, had Muslims invited them to take the course with a questionnaire to respond, to critique, to ask questions, to criticize, whatever they wanted to say about the course. And then the hard work of going back and rewriting it in light of the counsel and the critique we got from our Muslim friends. Not that we changed the gospel, no. But the question was, are we being heard as communicators of good news? Are we saying anything in the course which is, which is um, um, a distortion of Islam? We quoted the Quran many times in the course. For example, the, first, um, the very first line in the course, says, this is how we would use the Quran, the Taurat of the Prophet Moses came from God. The Quran says, God revealed the Taurat and the Injil. That's quoting from the Quran. For this reason, Muslims believe the Taurat is God's word. Christians and Jews also believe the Taurat came from God. All people everywhere should read the Taurat. It is God's word. So our first quote from a scripture is quoting from the Quran as a bridge to the gospel, you see. And so we would ask ourselves, when Muslims read that, will they feel that we are distorting the Quran? Are we making it say something that it is not saying? We want to use it in ways that when Muslims read it, they say, yes, you've understood the Quran. This is, this is exactly right, you see. And so Muslims read that first paragraph, they say, yeah, that's true. Of course we believe the Taurat. The Quran says the Taurat is God's word. Yeah, so, oh, so I guess we should read it, you see. 
That's the, that's the suggestion. So that's how we worked at it. I took the course uh, to a theologian who was uh, a very strong preacher of Islam. And I, you remember yesterday we said how that we lived right across from the mosque there in Eastley on 8th Street. He would stand right beside that mosque, just the cross, catty corner across the street from us with a megaphone, and he would preach uh, against the Trinity and against the gospel and proclaim Islam. Very strong missionary, Muslim missionary he was. And so I would, I would invite him to our home occasionally. We would have tea together. He would come with all of his disciples. We would have many dialogues in my home. So he, although he was preaching against <laughs> what we were about, he was a friend. And so I took it to him. I said, I don't want any secrets. I want all of you Muslims to know what we're doing. We're developing a Bible study course based upon the Taurat and the Zabur and the Injil. Those scriptures that you believe are revealed by God. And we want to write it in a way that, is, that, that Muslims see it as good news. And that we do not want in any way to write in ways that are offensive to Islam or a distortion of Islam. So please read this very carefully and critically. I'll come back in two weeks to get your response. So I came back two weeks later and he said, a remarkable study. Oh, I said, Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah is Arabic for praise be to God. <laughs> a remarkable study. He, and then he surprised me by saying, every Muslim should take this study. For it does reveal what Christians believe and what the gospel is about. And we don't understand the gospel. But this makes it clear. But then he said, however, chapter 3 of book number 1 made me very, very chagrined. That means angry. <laughs> and I, I said, why? Why does that make you so angry? Well, chapter 3 uh, was about was about the fall, Adam and Eve falling into sin, you see. He said it was absolutely obnoxious. It made me very, very angry. So I knew he had fallen off the ladder, see? This idea of the ladder, that this rung was too far apart. He'd fallen off the ladder. So I said to him, this is a Bible study course. It's not an Islamic course. It's a Christian Bible study course written for Muslims. So you will understand the gospel. So help me write this chapter. <laughs> God bless that man. He helped me write that chapter. <laughs> and instead of using the term fall, Adam fell into sin, this is what we said. When Adam and Eve took the fruit, disobeyed God by taking the fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden, in that action, they were choosing to turn away from God and to walk away from God. And when we turn away from God and walk away from God, we experience death and separation from God and become sinful. And then we said, all humanity participates in that turning away from God and experiencing death and sinfulness just as Adam and Eve experienced it. We all participate in that turning away. Not just Adam and Eve, all of us are infected by that turning away. So we use turning away language instead of fall language. He then said, I remember it like yesterday, I can now hear what you're saying, although I totally disagree with the theology. Because, see, in Islam, we've not turned away from God. We're not sinful, you see. I totally disagree with the theology, but I can hear what you're saying. And so he was back on the ladder, back on the ladder. So that's how we worked at it. And what it was doing was simply saying, if our Muslim friends believe that the Taurat came from God, and the Zabur came from God, and the Injil came from God, Let's develop a Bible study course, not called a Bible study course. We don't call it a Bible study course. The first one 
is based upon the first part of the Torah of the prophet Moses. That's how we advertise it in the little brochures we use, you see. We don't say it's a Bible study course. It's a course based upon the Torah, you see. And uh, what, would be the, what would be the first part of the Torah of the prophet Moses? That's too easy to answer, isn't it? Genesis, of course, Genesis. And so the Bible societies have published Genesis to go with it, you see. And then course number two, as you would imagine, is based upon the Zabud of the prophet David. And we also, in course number two, pull in one, uh, one lesson from the book of Isaiah. We say, you know, th there's also another prophet called Isaiah who wrote, um, who, who, who wrote scripture, which we should take seriously. But basically, it's based upon the Zabud of the prophet David. And then course number three, as you would imagine, is based, is based upon the Injil of Jesus the Messiah. And then course number four, of course, is based upon the Koran of the prophet Moses. No, 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 no. This is not an Islamic study. It's a study of the Bible, you see. So course number, number four is based upon, we say, other holy writings of God. And here in course number four, we look at, at, um, at the plan of salvation, uh, the intercessory work of Christ, the work of the Holy Spirit, the nature of the church, the practices in the church like baptism and communion and so forth, the second coming of Christ, those sorts of themes we look at in, in this final book. We hope by this time our Muslim friends are ready to look at other scriptures in addition to those scriptures that they know are revealed, namely the Taurat, the Zabur, and the Injil. Hopefully they're now ready for additional scriptures. And we're grateful that the Bible societies have published scriptures to go with these, with these courses. Um, and I'm also very grateful to have just gotten a communication from the Bible League that is worshiping, working in Russia and in Kazakhstan. And they say they will now be publishing this in Kazakh and in Russian with scripture portions to go with it for distribution and use throughout this region. And uh, of course, in our churches and so forth, if we wish to use these Bible League portions, I would assume that we can, we can, um, we can use them um, in, in, in the outreach. We have been, it's now in, I think, 45 languages, far beyond our wildest expectation. As far as I know, I may be wrong on this, as far as I know, there has been no objection from Muslim communities to this course. It is written so sensitively, we hope, we trust, and so connected with the worldview as good news, which we are commending to our Muslim friends, that it has been just very, very well received in so many parts of the world. Recently, I was in Singapore doing a seminar, and I was introducing the course, and a man stood up at the back of the room. He says, I'm from Pakistan, and I'm here because of that course. <laughs> I said, thank you, Lord. I never imagined in East Africa in those years ago that uh, I would someday be in Singapore <laughs> and meet a man from Pakistan who came to faith in Jesus through this course. I never imagined that. So God has used it far beyond our expectation. Yeah. So this, this, this is to say, this is one approach of taking the worldview very seriously and attempting to communicate within this worldview. And the belief system of Islam communicates the worldview. How do we then speak into that worldview as ambassadors of Jesus the Messiah? That's the question. And this is one attempt to be faithful to that calling. Now, later on in this class, I want to talk more at how we interpret Jesus uh, within this course, how we go about interpreting who Jesus is. We'll hold that till later. But for right now, simply looking at the, um, at the um, uh, worldview, in relationship to scripture and prophets and angels, um, we tried to develop this course to speak into that worldview. Questions or comments? How do you feel about using the Quran as a bridge for communicating the good news of the Messiah? I think it's a very good idea. Mm -hmm. And basically, I heard that missionaries who came to the different cultures, or other Gentiles or pagan cultures, use their ideas, their understanding 
to explain the gospel or something. But, I mean, while the Quran talks and tells that you have to read this, why not use it? I mean, yeah. this is just a, yeah. even much better. Yeah. While in other cultures, it's like the adulterers, they don't have any ideas, and Christians are using some of the thoughts, so why not using the things that was commanded by Quran? Other comments, thank you. Other comments? Do you see any cautions? Any potential problems? Could be that uh, you just use uh, stories and something that related to <coughs> Islam. And other sides of the Bible are not reflected in the study. I understand that it's, it's one of the best way, my best, the best way now to uh, share the gospel with Muslims, but then later, then we'll probably have to learn about other stories in the Bible. Okay, besides the Torah, the Zabur, and the Injil. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And of course, book, book number four does that. Book number four says, and there are other holy writings as well, which we should be aware of. And so we look at the book of Acts, and the book of Hebrews is very important, the intercessory work of Christ. We'll talk more about that later on. Um, and the book of Revelation, the second coming of Christ, the kingdom coming. So we do look at other scriptures in this book, yeah. But again, the latter idea, we begin with the scriptures that they are most acquainted with before we introduce them to additional scriptures. But that's a good point. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I still think about the the man, the Muslim man, who didn't like the Adam story. Yes. Okay, he said, I understood, but I disagree. Yes. But the question really, if he was commanded by Quran to accept as God's word, yes. how he can be disagreed? Yes. Mean, he, yeah. should, he shouldn't be disagreed. Yeah. Can we point yeah. this thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, that, see, see that's, that's a tension point. That's a tension point. And we'll talk about that more later on. It's one of the reasons that so many Muslims come to the conclusion that the Bible must be corrupted. Because even at a theological level like that, there is quite a great difference between the Quran and, the, and biblical revelation. Um, in the Quran, we're basically good. We're not sinful, <laughs> you see. In biblical revelation, we've turned away from God. We need redemption. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be an example of a divergence, yeah. So, um, I don't mean that by using this bridge material with the Quran um, that, uh, that it resolves the differences. It doesn't. Yes? I think it's a very good idea, but you asked for potential problems. I think one potential problem could be that you maintain the Quran as an authority, mm -hmm. when in fact we don't see it as an authority. Mm -hmm. And you pick out mm -hmm. parts that are mm -hmm. positive regarding mm -hmm. Christianity, mm -hmm. when in fact there's all sorts of parts that are, are mm -hmm. negative mm -hmm. and clearly mm -hmm. wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it may appear as if we look at the Quran as equal in authority to the Bible, in the way that we quote the Quran occasionally. Yeah. That, that's a critique that uh, has, has validity to it, I think. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, the gospel as it progresses around the world, um, I think where it is received by people most enthusiastically is because they do see there's a connection between the gospel and the traditional worldview. Like among the Zanaki of Tanzania, where I grew up, they all believed in God the Creator. Now, the understandings of God the Creator were different than biblical revelation, but my father built upon that. Yeah, you believe God the Creator. Now, here's the Gospel of Matthew that reveals to you more fully who God the Creator really is. And they were just astonished because they believe that God the Creator has gone on a journey and he'll never come back again. And here you read the Gospel of Matthew, the very first chapter, he is Emmanuel, God with us. Woo! You know, he hasn't gone away after all, he's come back, you see. So the whole understanding was revolutionized, but they began where they were um, in, in communicating the Gospel. Exactly right, yes. Um, I think another, another particularly difficult um, dimension of all of this is um, in making the Quran say what it doesn't say. And I feel very deeply about that. 
Uh, there's a movement going on now across the churches all over the world called Common Ground, where the idea is that when you really look at the Koran, it really <laughs> shares the gospel, you see. Um, and I, I feel that that sort of approach to the Koran is in danger of distorting the Koran. Personally, I get very angry when I hear Muslims preaching Islam from the gospel. <laughs> and they do that. They take the gospel and they preach Islam from the gospel by distorting what the biblical scriptures say. They distort it, you see. And I say to my Muslim friends, please don't do that. You know, uh, if you want, you know, hear us Christians bear witness to what the gospel says, don't distort it and make the gospel become Islam. It's not, you see. But they'll take the scriptures and they will distort them in that way. I think that is a wrong use of the Christian scriptures. And I'm very, very blunt in my conversation with my Muslim friends about that. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amount, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. We need, at, by the same token, not to make the Quran say, preach the gospel, you see. Now, there are signs of the gospel within the Quran. I believe that very deeply. But the Quran is not the gospel. Um, let me just... An illustration. This one kept me awake many nights. I would lay awake and pray about this as we worked with this in this book. The Quran says Jesus is Kalimatula, the Word of God. John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became human and lived among us. You see. Oh, it's the same. Look at that. Here's the gospel in the Quran. Jesus is Kalimatula. John 1, 14, Jesus is the word of God. You see, the Quran says he's the word of God, and here the gospel says he's the word of God. So Christians and Muslims agree, Jesus is Kalimatula. And in the course, I'll talk more about this later, we use that Quranic statement as a bridge. What worried me was, and I tested this with Muslims carefully, because I was worried. My worry was, I know that within the Quran, it does not mean what the Bible means by Jesus as the Word of God. The Quran goes on and explains very carefully what it means. It says, <laughs> it means that God spoke, and Adam and Jesus is miraculously created in the womb of the Virgin Mary, just as God spoke, and Adam is miraculously created. The Quran says, that's what Kalimatullah means. When the Quran says, Jesus is Kalimatullah, that's what it means, you see. But that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel, you see. So where we say, Jesus is Kalimatullah in the Quran, yes, it's a sign, I think, a hint, but it's not the fullness. And so we really struggle with how to use that hint and at the same time respect what the Quran means by Jesus as Kalimatullah. And when I meet with Muslims, like I was in the central London mosque some years ago, and uh, 400 people packing the place out, and they wanted to know, do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? I began with Kalimatullah. But then I said, uh, here's a sign. But I said, I fully recognize that as Muslims, when you read this, you believe that what it means is that God spoke and Jesus is miraculously created in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Is that what you mean? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, Sheikh, you understand Islam. That's exactly right. Yeah, 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 that's true. God spoke and, and Jesus is created in the womb of the Virgin. Yes, yes. Now, I said, tonight I want to invite you to hear what the gospel says about that. See, so I did not distort the Quran. I said, I noticed this in the Quran. I think this is a sign. Now, let me just share with you what the gospel says about that. So I went to John 1, 14. The word became human and lived among us. Jesus is truly, truly Kalimatula. <laughs> Not in the sense that God spoke and he is created in the womb, no, but in the sense that he truly is the living word of God. 
And that's what I did. So I built upon the gospel and attempted not to wrench the cordon to make it say something it's really not saying. Yeah. That, so that's a danger. Brothers and sisters, be very careful about that. And um, yes, the cordon has signs of the gospel all over it. I believe that very deeply. Just to believe in God. Merciful compassion. Every verse of the Quran except one starts with the merciful and compassion. Boy, that's, that's good news. That's really good. So we build upon those themes. But remembering that the Quran itself uh, is, is, not, is not the gospel. And so let's not wrench the Quran to make it proclaim the gospel when it really is, 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 um, is, um, is uh, it's Islam. It's, 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 it's not the gospel. Mm -hmm. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10-11 How to give to TVS Ministry You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.